Good evening everyone and welcome to St Nick's Durham. My name is Claire, I'm one of the curates here at St Nick's. We're in a very different season at the moment and taking this opportunity to bring our worship straight to you at home. Hopefully you will still know the warmth of our welcome and our isolated but together fellowship. Our preacher this evening is Philip Plimming. He is Dean of Cranmer Hall here in Durham. And Philip will be bringing us the first of two sermons on the Ten Commandments. If you'd like to learn a really easy way to remember all of the commandments and in the right order, there is a great video clip on YouTube called Learn Ten Commandments in Four Minutes remember forever. If you put that into your search bar, you should come up with a lovely New Zealand Salvation Army officer and uh, she will take you through the actions with your hands. So let us bring our hearts into the presence of the one who is always present to us. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. We're going to sing our praises to God now. We're going to start with a song called Waymaker. It means a lot to us at the moment to think of Jesus, the one who makes the way for us, the promise keeper, the miracle worker, the one in whom we can trust. So let's sing Waymaker. That is who you are. 
place who you are. God, thank you that you are our light in the darkness. Ever present, presence with us. Life giving, promise keeping, miracle working. Thank you that we can come to you. We think of the words from the Gospel of John. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. In the assurance of God's love, we confess together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past 
and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. So hear these words of forgiveness. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Rachel will now bring us our reading and then Philip will speak to us. Good evening everyone, my name is Rachel and I've been worshipping at St Nick's for about six months. Our reading this evening is from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, from verse 1 to 12. I'll just give you a moment to find that in your Bibles. So Exodus 20 from verse 1. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven or above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honour your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for your word, given many years ago, but by your Spirit speaking to us today. Speak to us afresh tonight, Lord, in this season, by your Spirit. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Very good to be with you tonight and uh, speaking to you in your homes uh, as we share in this service uh, together. My name is Philip Fleming. I serve um, on the staff at St John's College. I'm a member of the congregation here at Nick's and it's just a real joy to be with you. So this week, a 329 page bill passed through the House of Commons and the House of Lords and was given royal assent, called imaginatively enough the Coronavirus Act 2020. It gives the government uh, sweeping new powers to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, in closing bars and clubs, rewriting rules about who is working in the, in the NHS, how courts work and the like. And that's in addition to the secondary legislation from earlier in the week that gave the police the right to enforce social distancing. Now, given the seriousness of the COVID-19 threat, we um, understand that this new legislation uh, has to take place. We know that things have to work very differently for us to defeat the coronavirus impact. We recognise the importance of staying at home to help halt the transmission of the virus and, and we understand that we all need to do it to make it effective. So we get why the laws are there. But perhaps we hoped as we kind of settled down to be part of church tonight that we had enough of laws for one week, that perhaps something else would have been something we were hoping for. Uh, so that perhaps on Sunday evening, it would be nice to look at something that wasn't legally framed, let's put it like that. 
So perhaps it wasn't with absolute joy in our heart that we heard the reading set for tonight in our series in the book of Exodus. We've been uh, tracking the story of God's people uh, and their escape from Egypt across the Red Sea through the initial hostility of the desert. And tonight we hear heard the beginning of the giving of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, kicking off with the Ten Commandments, at least uh, we heard the first five. But the giving of the law doesn't exactly set the heart racing, does it? You know, is it something that's really good news? Is it good news for us in this season with all that we're facing? Well, Brandon, who was preaching last week, suggested that it was. He suggested it was good news. And I'm going to start by just quoting some of what he said about the law. This is what he said. The true climax of this story is not in the Exodus event, but in the giving of the law or the Torah. The end goal of all this is so that the Lord would dwell in the midst of his people, that they would serve and delight in him, that God will be with us. By giving the Torah, the Lord is creating a new identity for his people, no longer slaves, but daughters and sons, no longer objects to be mistreated, but a kingdom of priests, agents who would mediate the presence of God to a broken world. By receiving the Torah, they would be a light to the nations in that the world watching them would see the closeness and the beauty of Israel's relationship to God. A relationship characterised by love and affection. And so Brandon said, but Lord willing, we'll cover that more next week. Which was the answer is, thank you very much indeed, Brandon. But actually he's right and we will. Uh, Tonight we're going to look at what is good news Following on from what Brandon said, we're going to look at what is good news about the giving of the law to Moses. Using this familiar passage about the Ten Commandments as our base, we're not going to work through them one by one. I thought I'd leave that to Aaron for next week. But we're going to step back and look at the big picture of what the law is about within this Exodus story. And I want to look at that under two headings with two little words. You can remember them as you uh, finish this, listening to this tonight. Those two little words are do and done. Do and done. If you're watching this tonight, exploring faith, trying to figure out belief in a COVID-19 world, I hope you'll see Christian faith is not perhaps what you thought. It's better news than that. And if you're seeking to follow Jesus in these unprecedented times, I believe there's real encouragement for you to keep going. If you've got your Bibles there with you at home, please turn with me to Exodus chapter 20, uh, verses 1 to 12. And first of all, I want us to think about the law under the heading do. You see, the default way we think about the law is that it defines what we are not allowed to do. So don't drive above this speed. Don't take something without someone's permission. Or in today's world, don't get within two metres of someone you're not living with. And there's definitely quite a bit of that in the law that that the Lord gives to Moses. So don't take the name of the Lord in vain, for example. But the presence of that fifth commandment, honour your father and mother, suggests that there's more going on in the law than simply a list of what you're not allowed to do. There's something here about what we're called to do and not just don't do. And here I want to record my thanks to the fine Old Testament scholar Gordon Wenham, who taught me many years ago that the law of Moses is unlike our laws in one crucial respect. You see, normally the law shows where the bottom line goes. Go below that and you're in trouble. Wenham says that is one aspect of the law of Moses. But the law of Moses is also about the upper line as well. It's about vision. It's about what God's people are called to do and be. It's aspirational. Honouring your father and mother, that's just the start. As the law unfolds in Exodus and Leviticus and elsewhere, it's about a vision for justice and care for the alien and the marginalised. It's about giving people in debt a new start. It's about looking after the land. It's about honouring others in the way that we form relationships. It's a vision for living in God's character and God's ways. 
That's what Brandon was talking about last week when he's talking about people looking at the Israelites who had and lived by this law and saying, we want to follow their God. The law I want us today is about do. Now the tragedy is that God's people didn't always take it that way. By the time of Jesus, there were a number of people, Pharisees they were called, who seemed more concerned with spotting those who were going below the line than they were with this upper line, the vision of what the law was for. And Jesus was probably more critical of them than of anyone else. This is what he said in one place. He said, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill and cumin, but you've rejected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy and faithfulness. So there you have it from the lips of Jesus. It's not that the bottom line doesn't matter, but the point of the law is the vision of living out God's character, justice, mercy and faithfulness to a watching world. Put simply, it's about the difference between don't and do. Some people think, in my experience as I've talked to people over the years, some people think that Christian faith is all about don't. As a Southern Baptist saying used to go, don't smoke, don't drink and don't chew and don't go out with girls who do. So being a Christian in that view is, is all about what we're not allowed to do. But that's missing the point of the law. And it's missing a point about the Christian life. The Christian life isn't really about don't. It's about do. It's what we're called to. It's how we follow in the example of Jesus in justice, mercy and faithfulness. It's how we serve as he did. This week, the church remembered the great saint Oscar Romero. Archbishop of San Salvador, who spoke out and acted for justice in the dictatorship of El Salvador. Defying the threats of the government, he challenged the state on matters of poverty and violence in radio sermons that were heard right across the country. Forty years ago, on the 24th of March 1980, He was murdered by state-sponsored assassins while saying mass in his own cathedral. As a saint, he was defined not by don't, but by do. Closer to home, this week I caught up with news of a friend of mine who, as a vicar, is coordinating the collection and distribution of food parcels for people isolated on the council estate where he lives and serves. You'll be aware of countless other stories. There's the Refuse Cafe up the road in Chester Street, led by some of the most amazing faithful people. They realised that the God who spoke to Moses all those years ago is not a God just of don't. Most fundamentally, he's a God of do. In these dark times, we can pray that Christians will be seen as people who are not really about don't, but about do. If that is what the law was for all those years ago, it's what the faithful life is called to be today. Whatever your do is, whether it's serving in the NHS, looking out for a neighbour, driving a bus, calling a buddy in church every day, keeping your business going to keep others in employment, know that you are living out God's character to a watching world. Keep going with your do. So we've looked at the law under the heading of do. Now I want us to look at it under the heading of done. Because having said that, we're not going to look at these verses uh, verse in detail, kind of verse by verse. I do want us to look at verse two together, because before the law gets going with the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law, he says this. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery. Now that seems so introductory that it's easy to skate over it, but it reminds us of two things that God has already done up to this point. First, he's revealed who he is. 
When he calls himself the Lord in the Bible there, that's capital letters in our Bible, it, it can be approached sort of, uh, can be, be, be translated Yahweh in the original Hebrew, that's translated as I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. When the Lord reveals himself, he, he's showing Moses who he is and who he will be. In other words, God's showing up by revealing his name and his character to Moses at the burning bush. That was all the way back in Exodus chapter 3. So that's what those little words refer to. But secondly, God has rescued the Israelites out of slavery. See, the Israelites didn't escape due to a cunning plan of their own. It was through God's miraculous intervention that the Israelites were freed from slavery under the yoke of Pharaoh. That was all the stuff back in Exodus chapter 12. Revelation and rescue. And here's the really exciting bit. Chapter 3 and chapter 12 take place before chapter 20. I'll say that again. Chapter 3 and chapter 12 take place before chapter 20. Now you may say that is blindingly obvious, but in our heads we can often get it the other way around. We often think that in the Old Testament it works this way, God gives the law for his people to keep, they do so, and he rewards them with revealing himself and rescuing them. But that's not so. The law is not about creating a checklist for the Israelites to earn brownie points. It's about a creating a framework for the Israelites to respond to what has already been done for them, to the grace they've already received. What I mean, the Israelites hadn't earned God's revelation at the burning bush. They hadn't earned God's rescue from Egypt. Both were a gift, what the Bible calls grace. The law, yes, was about what a life pleasing to God looks like, but it was always a response to grace. Chapter 20 takes place after chapter three and chapter 12. It's revelation, it's rescue, and it's response. The law is a response to grace. Now track that forward to the time of Jesus and we see exactly the same theme reinforced. With Jesus, it's all about done. It's all about grace. In fact, those two things that verse 2 refer to, revelation and rescue, they're seen again in the person of Jesus. You see, in Jesus, we see God revealing who he is. This time, not at a burning bush, but in a Bethlehem manger. Not in a divine name, but in a divine baby. God showing up, not in word, but in flesh. Revelation. Secondly, we see God performing a great rescue act. An exodus from the clutches of what really plagues us in our world. Sin and death. In Christ's death and resurrection, we see sin paid for and death defeated. The grave does not have the victory. What a rescue. Can I say to you tonight what I say to myself at this time? Death does not have the final word. It did not for Jesus. And it will not for all who place their trust in him. And this is all grace. We did not sign a petition to get God to come to visit us. He came as a gift. We didn't earn brownie points to pay for Jesus' death and resurrection for us. Jesus died as a gift and he rose again as a gift. As Bishop Paul, the Bishop of Durham, says so powerfully in his pastoral letter released for this weekend, we are all having to deal with so many feelings at this time. Fear, sadness, pity, anger. But through all of this, he says, we can know that God is with us in Jesus. And tonight we remember God is with us not because we've earned it or had enough faith or been good enough, but because God is a God of grace. Always was. Always will be. Chapter three 
chapter 12, chapter 20. Revelation, rescue, response. That's grace. And so can I ask you tonight, are you resting in this God of grace? We are all living through so much, but we are all invited to rest in the God who has already showed up and who has already rescued us from sin and death. If tonight you're watching this and you don't know the gift of God in Jesus, can I invite you to take that gift tonight? As you simply put your hand into Jesus' hand, as you say sorry for trying to live on your own, you can know that Jesus came for you, that Jesus died for you, that he rose again for you, so that you can have life with him now and forever. We haven't talked a lot about the Ten Commandments tonight. That's over to Aaron for next week. Good luck, Aaron. But I hope you have looked at what the beginning of the giving of the law is all about. I hope we've seen that law is not really just about don't. It's about do. If, if we're looking to lead faithful lives in this season, we'll be more concerned with the do than the don't. Whatever you'll do is, keep on going. And secondly, we've seen that the law is given in response to what has been done, to revelation and rescue. It's not a checklist for brownie points, it's a response to a revelation and a rescue, both of which are a gift. Exodus 3, Exodus 12, Exodus 20, revelation rescue response and at such a time of this it's about resting it's about trusting in the god of grace who in jesus christ offers us life with him now and forever bishop paul ends his pastoral letter with these words they refer to what we need to do and to what has been done already in Jesus Christ. He writes, thank you for being faithful to Jesus. Hold fast to God. Fear not. Trust in the one who is the resurrection and the life. Amen. Thank you, Philip. That was terrific. We're going to continue to respond to Philip's words and uh, the way that God has been speaking to us through him with the uh, words of the song, God, I look to you. Another song of huge reassurance in these difficult times. God, I look to you. God, I look to you, and I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you, and you're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom, and you know just what to do, yeah. Forever all my days I will love 
to God. I'm going to introduce each topic of prayer with a short sentence and then leave a period of silence for about 15 seconds and I invite you during that time to offer your own prayer wherever you are. I'll end each section by saying Lord in your mercy and I invite you to respond hear our prayer. So let's pray. Lord it is so easy to feel overwhelmed with needs for prayer at the moment that it can be hard to know where to begin. So we start by taking a moment to rest in your presence, remembering that your love is always with us and that you know what is on our minds even before we find the words to say it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we think of all those who work in healthcare, those caring, treating and making decisions about future strategies. We offer our own prayer to you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we lift to you those who are overburdened, anxious, and whose livelihoods have been put at a risk at this uncertain time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we bring to mind those who are lonely through isolation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those across the world who are ill or close to death. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Lastly, Lord, we pray for ourselves, your church, that will be faithful in prayer and creative in mission. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now uniting our prayers together, as our Saviour taught us, so we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now back to Claire to lead us in the rest of our service. Thank you so much, Rachel, for helping us bring our concerns for ourselves and for the world before the Lord this evening. We're now going to declare our belief in God through the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let's say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We're going to sing together again. This is our closing song after which we will have a blessing. Our closing song is uh, uplifting and has tremendous words of hope and promise again. In Christ alone, let's sing together. Light of the world by darkness 
is slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. Thank you again for joining us this evening. We hope you enjoyed your time with us. You can join in again with Daily Prayer tomorrow at 9am and 12 midday and 9pm there will be night prayers. These are all being live streamed on our Facebook page. So now our final blessing. God of power, may the boldness of your spirit transform us. May the gentleness of your spirit lead us. May the gifts of your spirit equip us to serve and worship you now and always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Mm hmm.